The Royals have lost three in a row. What can we make of the new losing streak and how quickly can they bounce back? Let's talk about it on this edition of Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can find me on Twitter, Rex, at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. You also can find us on wherever you get your podcasts. That can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and we're on YouTube. Just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe. If you are a first-time listener, of course, welcome in. We love new listeners here on the Lockdown Royals channel. And if you want to know a little bit more about me, I work here in Kansas City over at Sports Radio 810 WHB. I do some co-hosting there. I do some hosting as well from time to time. And I do some producing. So I stay pretty busy uh, in the sports world on a daily basis. But when you come to, to this podcast, when you click on this link, you know that you are getting 30 straight minutes of Royals baseball. Now, today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. We're going to have a little bit more on them coming up in about 15 minutes or so. But if you're having any troubles with your car and you want to get it fixed and fixed up right, eBay Motors is going to have you covered. And we are so proud for them to be one of our sponsors today in this 30-minute Monday episode, a late-night episode. I was out at Kauffman Stadium covering this game for work, uh, so I had a chance to see this up close and personal. Uh get the energy from the crowd, go into the locker room after the game, talk with Matt Quattrero, talk with some of the players. Uh, so pretty busy night because uh, I also was at work all day. Uh, so apologize for this being a little bit late, but sometimes I like doing these podcasts after a game because the ideas are still fresh, the thoughts are still fresh. And this is going to be a very personal episode. I think that's the best way to say it because – Tonight, what I could tell throughout uh, some of my live tweets, throughout just some stuff I was reading, there was a lot of frustration building up amongst the fan base. And that's going to happen anytime you lose three in a row. I'm not naive to that. Uh, there was going to be some tweets that I put out there that were not going to go over well with a lot of people. And I know that, for the most part, not everything I put out there is going to be enjoyed. Right. If you're losing a lot of games, not everybody's going to want to hear positive stuff or hear a stat that is uh, sounds like it's making excuses, making excuses. It's not that I'm trying to make excuses. Sometimes I'm trying to say things in a different way other than these guys suck. Here's why they suck. Um, this is the worst player I've ever seen, because also I hope everybody can understand it's fine to be fair and biased or fair and unbiased. Excuse me. It's fine to be fair and unbiased. Uh, I do think there is also for an element of covering a team. You know, from my position, I can't go out there and say some of the things that my followers say about a certain player. Because at the end of the day, I have to go down to the locker room and, and talk with these players. If I'm bad mouthing somebody and I have nothing to back it up and I have to say it to their face, well, you know, that's maybe not the best look <laughs> to do that. It's easy to dislike somebody from a distance. It's easy to, you know, really criticize a player from a distance. And I think criticism is totally fair. If a guy's struggling, hey, here's why they're struggling. I don't think they should be playing every single day. But some things can be taken a little bit too far. And that's more so what I'm getting at. But for tonight, I think what I have uh, slowly gathered throughout these first 23 games is that because of the start, because of the success, anytime there is negativity, anytime there is losing, we are so quick to jump back on the, well, they're going to be as bad as last year. Oh, here comes the losing streak. This is who they really are. And we're going to talk about in segment number two, just how good this team has been or not at all, really. Is it just because they played the White Sox seven times and of their 13 wins, more than half are against one of the worst teams baseball has ever seen at this level? We're going to talk about that coming up in about you know seven to eight minutes or so. But what I really want to hammer in to begin this show is this is a very long season. And emotions are going to go up and down. That's just the reality of it. And I understand that it's easy to get caught up in the moment. You know, Friday night, we all were caught up in a, in a pretty 
positive moment. We were all feeling juiced up. The energy was high. The vibes were good, as Vinny Pasquantino would say. They just beaten Baltimore in game one. It was a, a dramatic game. You know, they had no runs until the sixth or seventh inning. They erupt for six. Melendez had a big three-run home run in that game. Everything felt good. And in that snapshot, in that point in time, you feel great about the direction of this team. But you also factor in, you know, you're 20 games into the season. And it's never as good as it seems. It's also never as bad as it seems. Right? I, I was texting a buddy uh, tonight about the game and just, you know, how crazy it feels that a three-game losing streak feels awful because they haven't had one so far this year. And when you are given that taste of success, we've seen already the 20 games. There's a lot of fans out there that are waiting for this inevitable collapse. And maybe right now uh, you are staking your claim that this is going to be the inevitable collapse. But I kind of take it in this way. Yes, they've lost three in a row. The offense hasn't been that great. They had a very uh, dramatic game on Saturday. It was an exciting game. I was out there. I was actually out there all three games. So maybe I need to stop because they're 0-3. Uh, when I've been out there, at least in the last couple of days. I did witness a couple of wins before that. But what I would say is it's a team that's coming off 106 losses, okay? And believe me, I'm one of those people that I don't want to hear the, well, give them some time. I mean, they may not make the playoffs. If they win 75 games, that's still a big improvement. That is true. I don't really enjoy hearing it because, you know, 75 wins, it's not really a memorable year. The reason I get juiced up for this podcast, the reason I love doing this, going to these games, covering the team, I hope they make it far. I hope they get to the playoffs because if they don't and they only win 75 games, well, maybe toward the end of the year, it's not going to be as fun to do this podcast if you can pick up what I'm putting down. But there is some truth to the fact that this is a team that did lose or tie a franchise record for losses, okay? So the jump is not going to be from 106 losses to 106 wins, right? There is a chance, even in a really good year, this team wins like 80 to 85 games, and that would be tremendous. There's still 77 to 82 losses in there. Nights like tonight, nights like Sunday. Saturday as well, where you just don't feel good about the team. That happens. Every team in baseball is going through that. The highs, the lows. This is a terrible team. Oh, they suck. This is really who they are. And then if they win a couple in a row, it's, oh, this team's back on track. They're a playoff team. Here's why they can go far. And what I would say to those out there living game to game, Give yourself a chance to take a step back, take a deep breath, and go, it's a really long season. We're going to talk about the 2013 Royals in the final segment because I think there's something interesting I want to point out. Speaking of those emotions that run so high and can get really low. All right, three-game losing streak in the grand scheme of things, if they can snap it tomorrow, is not bad at all. It's, it, you're probably going to have a five-game losing streak at one point. And believe me, I'm going to have to come on this podcast every single time and just tell everybody to take a deep breath. Now, this could be the beginning of a bad stretch. Let me be very clear about that. They could lose seven in a row, eight in a row. But the way I'm choosing to take it right now is let's wait till that happens, right? I had a couple people you know, responding to my tweets tonight saying they'd given up. That this was it. Oh, it was a nice run, but now they're going to be terrible. Oh, here's the terrible stretch. If you are that fan that wants to take that approach, all more power to you. I'm never going to tell you how you can be a fan. It's everybody's own experience, right? If you want to be negative, you want to be positive, you want to be in the middle. We talked about this last week. You can be whoever you want to be. But I would say that this isn't like the NFL, and you would know that. This isn't like college basketball, college football. It's one game a week or two games a week, you play every single night. And that's why it can be exhausting. You'll be burned out by game 50. You know, if they win tomorrow night, you'll go to bed happy. You might celebrate with a beer or two and go, oh, I feel better about the team now. 
I feel better about the direction. They lose tomorrow night. Maybe your prediction will be correct that this is going to be seven, eight, or nine in a row. But the way I'm choosing to take it is until that happens, let's still enjoy the fact that they're playing good baseball in April, right? And there's been very few games. There have been two games this year. They've been beaten from the get-go. They lost to New- the Mets in New York 6-1, to one, and they even led in that game 1-0, to nothing, and they got shut out 5 to nothing on Sunday. Tonight, it wasn't particularly close, but they lost by two. They had a chance, I thought, at one point in the, the eighth inning or the seventh inning, I believe it was. Actually, the inning before that in the sixth, they had a tying run at the plate. So there is a tremendous step forward with this team through 23 games, considering they were one of the worst teams in baseball last year. So that's where I think the standard is It's on a lot of different levels for people. I don't have them at a standard of, You got to win all these close games. You got to be able to take every single series. That's the goal. That's the hope. I mean, that's always going to be the hope. I'm still hoping they can take three of the next three games here against Toronto. I hope they can take the final three, right? But I also understand if they only take two or they only take one, you got to put things into perspective. And I will do my best to not be this grossly over-optimistic, positive person. I do understand a part of doing this is not trying to make an excuse for everybody. But I also think that there's a point in time where we can just take a collective breath and go, at this point, three losses in a row. It ain't good, right? Nobody's going to celebrate three losses in a row. But let's hold off on it's going to be the inevitable end of this team. There's still three games over 500. And my prediction through the first eight or 32 games was 14 and 18. They have to go one and eight over the next nine games to just reach that mark. It wouldn't be a great stretch if they can be over 500 in those first 32 games. I think that's pretty impressive considering how tough this opening part of the schedule was. But if you're not there, if you are really mad with this team, you can use this as fuel, as uh, you want to prove me wrong or something. Because I think tonight's episode is about the people that A, either want to remain optimistic, B, have given up, or C, are looking for a reason to, to go to either side, to be negative or to be positive. And these next two segments might answer a couple of questions for that. So let's take a quick break and come back and move on to our second segment, which is, are the Royals only winning baseball games because they played one of the worst teams that's ever been assembled in Major League Baseball? We'll dive into that next on Locked on Royals. You are tuning to Locked on Royals on the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can follow me on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. Before we go any further, let's give a shout out to a few of the sponsors today, starting with eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because of the eBay owners, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. And eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. We also want to give a shout out to the other sponsor, one of the other sponsors today, and one of the more popular mobile games out there in Monopoly Go. Now, one thing that I've preached countlessly and have done it more so last week was the leaderboards that you can check in on. And I've been doing that a lot on uh, the Monopoly Go app. And you've probably heard of it because, as I said, it's super popular. It's it's really being downloaded more than any other game out there. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. And it's a great mobile twist on classic Monopoly. And you can play it anywhere at any time. You explore hundreds of Monopoly boards from Las Vegas to Camelot to the moon all while raking in a huge fortune. Charge rent on iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, and you can charge your friends rent on your iconic properties. Or go after their Monopoly money by pulling bank heists and taking wrecking balls to their landmarks. But my favorite part is the leaderboards, where you can see who's Monopoly tycoon and who's gone bankrupt. So go get yourself on the charts. Download Monopoly Go. It's now free on the App Store and Google Play. Well, one thing I have seen pretty consistently 
in this first 23 game stretch. And it more so happened after the Royals left Chicago. And there was this belief that this team is only good. Their run differential is only good because they've gotten to play the Chicago White Sox, who got shut out for the eighth time in 22 games tonight against the, uh, it was, it wasn't Philadelphia. They just were in Philadelphia. They got shut out by, I'm already blanking on who it was, to be honest with you. Uh, Minnesota. It was Chris Paddock in Minnesota. So a AL Central matchup, and the Twins had no problem knocking around. Uh, it was Jonathan Cannon, who the Royals saw in Chicago in that last series. But they were shut out again. So this is going to be a team that I just don't think even gets to 50 wins, if I'm being quite honest with you. And the Royals did what I think everybody wanted them to do against a bad team. You know, think about how we'd all feel if they only went four and three against the White Sox. You feel pretty bad. And honestly, if they went four and three against the White Sox, uh, they would not have been anywhere near where the record is right now. But there is this argument being made of, well, they're only good because they got to beat up on the White Sox six times over the seven games they played them in April. And I do think there is some truth to that, that the pitching got inflated. I think I still think it's a good rotation, right? It's a good bullpen, or at least it's a bullpen that's getting better. Um, I think the lineup at home in that series got to flex its muscles a little bit against some really bad pitching. And like I said, I don't think the White Sox win 50 games. I think they're probably going to be in the 40 range. And that is just shocking to see. As hard as it is to lose 100 games, I think they lose 110 plus. But I also think it's fair to point out that beating up on a bad team is not necessarily a negative like, yeah, they did beat up on a bad team, but that's what you have to do. They won six of seven games against one baseball team in a span of two weeks. It wasn't the greatest baseball team in the world. I'm just saying they did what they needed to do. And they have not played well, or I would say they have not played up to standard, considering what they did against Chicago and the other teams they've played. They only took two from Baltimore over the six games they played them. They only took one from Minnesota and the three they played. They did sweep Houston, but Houston only is 7-16 and 16 right now. I believe that's what they're at right now. So that sweep doesn't look as impressive. They only took one from the Mets in a three-game series. So there are things you can nitpick. But I also think that you can buy some stock into the one game they won in a couple of series against teams that... I believe to be playoff teams. And we'll see what happens in this Toronto series. But I think some numbers can be inflated by that. But the idea of, well, let's just not even consider the other games they won. Because, yeah, they have won more than half of their games against a terrible baseball team. But they've also won six games against other opponents. They won three against Houston, even though Houston was banged up. They still had a majority of their stars out there playing. They faced arms that had been in their rotation last year. They did face Nick Aragetti, who was a rookie in game one, I believe that was. Maybe it was game two. But they saw Hunter Brown and tagged Hunter Brown for nine runs. Hunter Brown was in their rotation last year. They saw Jordan Alvarez. They saw Jose Altuve. They saw Kyle Tucker. They saw Chaz McCormick. They saw Jeremy Pena. They saw Josh Hader. They, they saw a chunk of guys that are going to be playing for the Astros all season long and were a part of World Series championship teams. And I, I just think that it's it's so tough to, I guess, look at what they did against the White Sox and then just say, well, they're only good because they beat up on them. And it could be the case. You know, I don't believe the Royals are as good as what they showed against the White Sox. I don't think the rotations is good. As what they showed against Chicago, I don't think in some of those games the offense erupted for double-digit runs. It's not that good. That was more so of just beating up on far inferior players. But we we are so soon to forget the Royals were that inferior team last year. So step one to me from climbing out of the cellar, climbing out of the basement, is you got to show that you are no longer that team. It is somebody else. And that's somebody else of the Chicago White Sox. So, yes, I do think there are numbers that are inflated because you played a bad team. But to just discredit those wins, even if the team is awful, even if you put a triple-A team at the big league level, you got to beat them. 
And if you beat him six out of seven times and the one loss you had was by one run, I'll take it. I'll take it. I mean, you you shouldn't apologize for wins at the big league level. That's where I'm at with it. They do to earn the respect of some people that doubt them. They have to beat teams that are far better than Chicago. They probably need to split with Toronto to get the respect of people going, well, they can't beat anybody that's not named the White Sox. And their Astros sweep is kind of discredited now because Houston isn't very good. They've lost every other series. So you need to split this series with Toronto to earn that respect. You need to take a series against the Tigers, who are now 13-10. and 10. Now you need to go face this Toronto team again in Canada uh, next week, early on next week, and you got to find a way to take two of three. So there are things on this checklist that they need to get done to prove to everybody out there that they are going to be worth more than just wins against the White Sox. And we are going to see impressive wins. I thought Friday was an incredibly impressive win, probably the most impressive win of the season. But we write it off because they've lost three in a row since then. And I just think that's a part of the long season. You can't get too high. You can't get too low. And I I can absolutely agree with the statement of, I think some of their numbers are inflated because of the White Sox. That I think is undeniable. But you also shouldn't apologize for beating a team. They beat a team. They beat a team soundly. They swept them in a four-game series. They took a series on the road. You, you shouldn't have to apologize for that or, or be called terrible because you did that or say that you you suck because you won more than half your games. Well, they had to play them. They, they can't control the fact the White Sox were scheduled against them seven times in April. So we'll see just how legit they really are. But 13-10 and 10 is 13-10 and 10 right now. And no, I don't think they are like the 2021 Royals that had a negative run differential at the end of April. This is still a team that when they're beating teams, they're beating them soundly. When they're losing, they're losing by just a little bit. And the three games over 500 still lost three in a row. That's a negative. But we'll see uh, what they can do against Toronto, the remaining parts of this series, which continue tomorrow night. Kevin Gossman will face off with Michael Walker. Okay, we're going to move on to our final segment. But before we do... We want to give a shout out to Locked On Sports Today, free 24-7 sports streaming channel, program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. For our final segment, I want to draw some similarities to the 2013 Royals because I had a very interesting conversation with a coworker today about that coworker wanting this team to resemble the 2013 Royals. Well, I'll tell you about that long and weird season that happened over a decade ago next on Locked on Royals. You are tuned into Locked on Royals and the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson, and you can follow me on Twitter X at J underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 1-5. And you can also find us on wherever you get your podcasts. That can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and we're on YouTube. Just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe. Before we go any further, Want to give a shout out to the final sponsor today in FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all in an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel. America's number one sports book. Well, earlier today, I was speaking with a coworker about the Royals, just answering a few questions that that person had. And, you know, I, I had this interesting conversation trying to make the, the tie between this group and the 2013 Royals. Because if you talk to a Royals fan, I think for the last seven years, they've been hoping for a 2013 Royals team to appear. Because that team is still held very near and dear to true Royals fans' hearts. You know, 2014 and 15, they were easy to love. They were easy to embrace. But 2013 is where that ride really began. Where everybody had a chance to believe for more than just a few months of the season. I mean, the Royals were in that thing until September. They had brought in some pieces to make them more competitive. James Shields, Irvin Santana were in that rotation. 
At the tail end of that year, they bring in Jeremy Guthrie. You know, Hosmer and Moustakis and Perez and Escobar and Kane, they're all playing together. Gordon, Butler, they had the Billy Butler rally barbecue sauce out there. The team became very much embraced by the city. They were lovable. And I think that's every fan's hope for this group right here, that you can look up in, in July and August and they're right there. They may not be leading the division, but they are within striking distance. And as I'm getting these, these texts and these tweets rolling in tonight about, oh, this team is now going to lose seven in a row. They're going to lose eight in a row. They're terrible. Fire Matt Quattrero, bench this guy, demote this guy. It made me smile because I remember very similar conversations uh, back with that 2013 squad. Because what I hope doesn't happen with this squad is that Royals team started 17 and 10 at one point. So if the Royals won their next four, they would be exactly where the 2013 Royals were. 17 and 10, you're getting toward the end of April. You would be, I think, right on the cusp of May, I think a few days from May. But in 26 days, that Royals team, the 2013 Royals team, went from 17 and 10 to 22 and 30. They went five. And what would that be? 20? 5 and 20 over their next 20 or uh, 25 games, that would be. And I remember a lot of what was being said. Because baseball, it can be such an infuriating sport when you're not going well, when you're losing. Because it's losing every single day. It's not like the other sports where you lose and then you have time to process. It's every single night. And that 2013 team got everybody to buy in through the first 30 games and then bottomed out in the month of May. We're awful in May. And then they slowly started to rebound and got really hot in the summer. I'm not saying that's what will happen with this team. I say this because this team is 13 and 10. There could be a scenario, you look at one point and they are, 15 and 20 or 15 and 22 and you go oh seven games under 500 it's over but you forget to put the season in just this big picture because it is such a long year in fact they could be 30 and 17 and we'd all be feeling great about 30 and 17 i mean that would be incredible for this team they'd probably be in first place it's still 47 games they could go from 30 and 17 to 30 and 32 in a blink of an eye. Now, losing 15 in a row would be pretty absurd. So let me say like 35 and 35. It can happen just like that. You're 70 games through. You're not even halfway there. But you feel like you're deep into the season. Tonight's episode was about perspective and what you can take away and what you need to be a little bit careful on. And that's just what I'm trying to get at. I remember the 2014 Royals. They were terrible right out of the All-Star break. They went to Fenway and got swept out of Boston. And everybody kind of had this feeling of, man, are they really ever going to catch fire? Are they ever going to catch fire long enough to ride it in the postseason? And that they did. The 2015 squad never struggled, really, it felt like. I think in September, they didn't play well, but they had already had the damn division locked up. So they weren't really you know, playing for their lives every single night like the 2013 and 2014 Royals team did. But I'm just saying, there is going to be a lot of peaks and valleys. There's going to be five-game win streaks where you feel really good about the team. There's going to be five-game losing streaks. You're going to feel bad about the team. But just for those out there that are holding on to hope, this group is the 2013 Royals. Well, the 2013 Royals got everybody to believe in them when they were 17 and 10. And then they went 5-20 and 20 and had a lot of people jump off that bandwagon and stop showing up to the games until the summer when the Royals started winning again and got people to believe in them. It is such a long and treacherous season. It's a marathon. And you got to take things with a grain of salt, but also enjoy when things are good. Things are not good right now for the Royals, but they could snap out of it and win their next three. They could win two of their next three. They could win five of their next seven, and you feel good. It's all about limiting those five and 20 stretches. But even if that happens, 
there is still a chance you rebound from it. The 2013 Royals were a good indicator of that. So if you're holding out hope for that, I'm just saying, it's never as bad as it seems. 13 and 10, 22 and 30. But also the end result for the 2013 Royals would be more uh, than gladly taken by a lot of Royals fans out there that just want competitive baseball all summer long. Well, that's going to do it for another edition of Lockdown Royals and the Lockdown Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson, and you can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJanderStore15. One last shout out to Lockdown Sports Today. It's here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown plus our national shows covering every league. Find Lockdown Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Tomorrow, we'll either have a show right before the game or after again to recap what happened between Michael Walk and Kevin Gossman and dive into these offensive numbers. Why is it so boom or bust for this group, and can they ever even it out? But until then, you take it easy, Kansas City.